Morning, everyone. I'm actually just going to switch my camera on so everyone can see me um, just for the introduction. Good morning. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague and this morning speaker, Dr. Warren Brittany. Um, Dr. Brittany is currently head of department for our statistics department at the Nelson Mandela University and has worked in the higher education sector for over 14 years. He has held the position of president for the South African Statistical Association from January 2020 to December 2022, and is currently the outgoing president for the association. He has a wealth of knowledge um, on statistical data analytics, stochastic efficiency analysis, and data science. He has supervised postgraduate students and published papers in statistical modeling and machine learning applications in a range of areas, including sports, um, finance, econometrics, and renewable energy. He has been involved in hosting the SASA conference in 2012, 2019, and most recently 2022. And he's also a union committee member at the Nelson Mandela University. Today's talk, he will cover an overview on selected statistical applications in renewable energy research, and we look forward to hearing what research is being done in this field, as we all know the importance of energy in our country. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to call on our speaker now, Dr. Warren Brittany, to take over, and we look forward to his talk. Thank you. Thanks, Chantelle. That was a great introduction. And um, from my side, uh, a lot of this work, actually almost all of it, is, has been done in conjunction with Dr. Clohessy. So her enthusiasm is not faked, but is an honest reflection of her opinions on the matter. Um, you'll see her name come up sev uh, several times during this presentation. So um, it could actually be hers. Anyways, so the idea here is that I'm going to be presenting to you um, on a number of items. You can see them all scattered around the page there. I'm going to start off just giving you an introduction um, and just showing you what we've been doing in um, renewable energy research over the last, I'd like to say five or six years, but it's probably gone a bit further than that. I'll be touching on some of our research outputs and some of our analysis one thing I will say is that I'm not going to go into too much detail of, in the methods. I'll touch on them very briefly, just so that we can get an overview of the, of the methods that we're using, hence the name. Um, so let's have a quick, let, let's get into it. At some point, we'll be getting into it. All right. Okay, so obviously, uh, Dr. Glohesi mentioned, it's a very important field, renewable energy. Uh, with concerns related to obviously global warming, depletion of fossil fuels, load shedding most recently and most um, pertinent to us. Renewable energy has seen accelerated growth in recent years. Um, far more people have solar panels on their houses. Businesses are going down the solar panel route. It's, it's uh, a way to get around load shedding, but it's also a way to um, be environmentally conscious, and environmentally friendly. So I think that um, particularly in South Africa, this is a very important area, and we had, and we were we got a jump start on it a couple of years ago. Uh, so much of the research into this field, what we found was that it's been done in the physical science and engineering disciplines. So if you go to a renewable energy conference, in all likelihood you're going to see a um, a physicist and an engineer, and they're probably going to make up most of the of the delegates. So what was lacking was a statistical component and, a statistic and legitimate statistical analysis. And there uh, was the gap for the team that we created um, because physicists do physics and engineers do engineering and we do stats. And all of that creates data. Data needs to be analyzed and, we're, and we come along and do that best out of everyone, even though everyone thinks they can do it, uh, statisticians do it best. So the statistical applications used in these research areas 
um, but our team at Nelson Mandela University are now highlighted, and that's what I'm going to be going through um, in this presentation. So that's the purpose. This is our small team. Um, I'm not including the, the students, obviously. They play a big role, but these are the, are the staff members and the, and the drivers of the team in no particular order. Um, it's myself, Dr. Brittany, uh, Dr. Glohesi, she did the introduction, and then Prof. Ernst van Dijk, he's from the, the Department of Physics. So there's our little, um, our connection to that, to that group of, um, of academics and researchers. I am going to warn you now, before we carry on, that I'm doing this from my home, and my home is not a quiet place, not anymore. I've got two 10-month-old babies, one of which is sleeping a few doors down, and is due to wake up sometime soon. So if you hear screaming, it's not just me, I'm just not, not just my insides, it's my baby, and I'm not being negligent by just standing, staying here um, talking to you, the baby will be attended to. All right, so please don't, don't, cons don't be concerned. Um, okay, so that's the team. Now, I just want to touch on the methods. So we, we mentioned in the talk was an overview of statistical applications, statistical techniques in the renewable energy field, but which methods have we used? This is obviously um, a broad brush over the methods that we used, but I'm going to touch on them um, each individually, and then I'm going to go into their applications, particularly in the um, in each uh, field and in each study. All right. So the first one are experimental design and, and GLMs. So this was the start of our research. I say our, but this was uh, pioneered by Dr. Clohesi. Um, it was a randomized uh, experiment was carried out and a generalized linear model was fitted uh, and this was in a wind energy study so we and we will touch on that a bit later we also have done some bayesian analysis and bootstrapping um so random effects models both one way and two factor nested models uh, were used to create tolerance intervals and these were done these were assessed in a using a bayesian approach and a bootstrapping approach. Uh, we will touch on that later too. And then computer vision, this is probably our most, I could say prolific area of um, investigation. We've published uh, some papers and some uh, conference proceedings in this area. And essentially we're using um, statistical methods, uh, feature-based methods, convolutional neural networks, um, to identify faults and um, classify faults in PV, or sorry, photovoltaic. So PV stands for photovoltaic or solar um, on solar modules. Or, and so we want to find out what those problems are. We want to classify them. We want to do that using a, a neural network or a statistical approach. And then we also used some other uh, Neural networks, you see gener uh, generative adversarial models and variational autoencoders. We use those when we didn't have big enough data sets to, to um, explore these, these methods. And then obviously throughout, we look at some machine or statistical learning methods. I know some of my colleagues get quite upset when you talk about machine learning methods because most of them, almost all of them have got a very deep statistical roots. So machine learning should probably be called statistical learning, but I'm going to uh, walk the fence on that one and just mention both names. And the ones that we look at are random forest support vector machines, neural networks, and then obviously your simulation studies, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as we go along. So, so throughout the next half an hour or so, I'll be talking to you about um, our research into these fields using the methods that I've just touched on. All right, so the first uh, foray into this was wind energy, and this was through my colleague, Dr. Clohesi, um, and she came to Sasa 2010 and asked everyone, how loud is too loud? And that was her first slide, so I thought that it would be only proper for, for it to be math first slide too. So the idea here is that we wanted to know, at the time, there was a comp 
complaint. I hear a baby. There was a complaint about a um, about whether or not it is okay to put wind turbines up in residential areas. Do they make too much noise? Is it too loud? And then obviously how loud is too loud? So what was done was a randomized experiment and a general linear model were fitted. So to assess the, whether the noise generated from micro wind turbines constituted noise when compared to other accepted environmental sounds. So this was a, a investigation where noise measurements were taken individually around Port Elizabeth over a period of about two months, I would imagine, at different times of day at different sites uh, to randomize that uh, data collection process. And the linear model fitted there was the one that um, was fitted initially, obviously, as the model reduced and um, interaction terms were added, the model uh, changed, but that was the basic model that was fitted. Um, and you can see that the fact the Y was the was the loudness and the and the independent variables, your X is there, represented your wind speed, the site of the measurement. So that went from uh, a actual wind turbine um, right next to a wind turbine to a residential neighborhood to a, a rural area to the beachfront to a busy street um, and then obviously there were times of day so it was morning afternoon evening distance from the perceived sound or the source of the sound and then the direction of the wind were, were all factored into that into that model. So it was found that noise added when controlling for wind speed and direction. So the noise added by this micro wind turbine uh, was equivalent, spot wrong there, to an increase of uh, 7.39 decibels. Okay, so the GLM model estimates in this case were uh, your wind speed was uh, added um, one decibel per one meter second increase in wind speed. And then um, you can see how each of the other ones affected that. So the residential um, area was taken as the baseline, and you can see how these affected affected the, the baseline sound. Um, most notably, you can see that the ambient site was in truth was in truth an ambient site because it was the quietest. Um, the vertical axis wind turbine was actually situated close to the ambient site, so it can show you how much that imp increased that. Uh, the noise, it was a small increase. And then obviously, um, you can see that the street created a, a quite a bit of additional noise. Comparatively speaking, you could, you could say that the horizontal axis wind turbine was a similar increase in noise to uh, staying near the beachfront. All right, so that was um, the study, and this is what it resulted in. In 2014, there was a paper um, the evaluation of noise levels of two micro wind turbines using a randomized experiment. And that was um, authored by myself, Dr. Kohesi, uh, Professor Sharp, who I believe is here, and Freddie Foster. And that was, and he's also from our physics department. Okay, so that kind of started and ended our um, investigations into wind energy. Uh, the focus moved over to solar energy. Um, and that's where I'm going to take us now. Again, Dr. Klohesi pioneered this, so um, she gets a lot of credit for a lot of this work that we've done in our team. Um, and so we look at the, uh, we're going to now look at tolerance intervals, the Bayesian approach, a non and then the non-parametric approach. And um, we'll have a look at what's been done and what was done, my apologies during this, um, in this area. Okay, so Dr. Klohesi investigated the Bayesian approach as part of her, of her PhD thesis. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'm just going to touch on the basics that were covered because those feed into what was done um, later on by some of our students. Firstly, uh, we looked at variance component models but we are obviously mean Dr. Klohesi. Um, and they and two random effects models were used. A one-way random effect that looks like that, and a two-factor nested random effects model that looks like that. And that was used to model your daily energy 
uh, yield and hourly power output from a given PV system. So unique to this study is that it actually viewed the solar power generation as a production process. So you can actually see whether your, um, your process or your solar panels are working correctly and are doing what you expect them to do um, by treating it as a process control type of study. And also you can then use it to predict going forward what to expect in terms of your power output. Uh, so using these models, um, tolerance intervals were created and um, estimated using Bayesian simulation. Three types of tolerance intervals were investigated, the alpha, beta, two-sided, the alpha expectation, and the fixed and advanced tolerance intervals. Um, they're quite intricate and in-depth, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the one I do want to just mention for illustration purposes is that uh, for the one-way model, the fixed and advanced tolerance interval estimates uh, estimates the content of the one-sided interval S to infinity using this formula. Okay, so those that mu, sigma, uh, epsilon, and sigma A are all simulated from the uh, Bayesian process, and then you get a content coverage from the for the interval, and you can make assessments, and I'll show you how those are done. So um, the estimates of the fixed and advanced tolerance intervals for the output of the PV system for all seasons is given in this table. So what that means is that if you look at the autumn uh, season over there for the two megawatt, uh, the four megawatt value. So the four megawatt hour value, it would be that S value that's given in this previous slide over here. So that gives me the lower limit of my power output. So the fixed and advanced tolerance interval for autumn uh, was found to be this these values here. So 0.8 to 0 0.986. And this means that for future months in the season of autumn, between 82.4 and 98.6% of energy yield estimates will fall in the interval, which is above four megawatt hours. So when it comes to planning purposes, you know that you've got quite a high probability that your energy yield is going to fall above that, um, that value. And as you, uh, that value of four megawatts for this particular system. So as you can see, as the um, as the megawatts increases or the power requirement increases, the likelihood of uh, achieving that decreases. And now it's a way of quantifying what kind of output you can achieve uh, achieve in each season, in each season. And after all of this, this is just a small excerpt of the PhD that uh, Dr. Clohesi um, wrote. Uh, this resulted in that PhD. So, so birthed our, our interest, because now this is when I joined the fold, in the, um, in the tolerance intervals and uh, PV assessment using tolerance intervals. And what we brought to it was, instead of using a Bayesian approach, we thought, let's look at a non-parametric approach. Um, and this approach was used in by one of our students, Yanni Daisel, um, and she used a bootstrap resampling approach um, based on a paper by Rabafka, who, who published in 2007, I believe that was in chemistry. Um, and they used uh, two-sided um, alpha beta con and alpha and beta expectation tolerance intervals. They called them beta expectation um, as equivalent to the alpha expectation ones that were done in Dr. Clohesi's oh. dissertation. I oh, hear that somebody is um, unmuted. All right. And um, so what was done is the one-way method for the non-parametric approach or the bootstrapping approach um, was, was formulated by Rabafka, but Daisel came along and and in the paper proposed a bootstrap methodology for the two-factored nested random effects model. This, is, this was a novel, a novel um, inclusion in to the literature. And she used that to assess the daily energy yield of three types of um, solar panels. 
uh, three types of technologies or substrates. So it was the amorphous silicon, the copper indium silicon, and the polycrystalline uh, silicon mo mo modules. So um, I, you can see a idea of the result that we're given there, and the and that will give you an idea of the prediction of the amount of daily energy outputs that a module will get um, in a different season. So for example, if you look at the summer month um, for the polycrystalline silicon module there, you'll see that it goes, I don't know if you will, I don't think that you can see my mouse, but it's the second last uh, value down there at the bottom going from 1,251 to 1,417. And this interval predicts that uh, in a summer month, 95% of future daily output values for this module, so the power output, will be between these two values. So 1,251 uh, watt hours and 1,417 watt hours. So this created a non-parametric approach which was which is to um, supplement the literature that's already been there uh, using either a Bayesian approach like Dr. Clohesse used or a classical approach. The, ish, the, the reason that this uh, bootstrap based one was investigated is that both the Bayesian method and the frequentus or classical method both had this assumption of normality in the in the model formulations. The bootstrap approach uses the data and um, is meant to be less uh, susceptible to deviations from normality. And But we hadn't investigated that yet. We just developed the algorithm and then used it empirically without actually testing the, um, the coverages and the, co and the performance of these, um, these proposed methods. So that obviously was a drawback. And we we had to address that. But before that, I just want to mention that this that this paper this resulted obviously in a paper from in the SASIC, so the South African Solar Energy Conference uh, proceedings, um, and that's as you can see, Yanni Daisel and the rest of the team. So again, as I mentioned before, uh, we go back to non this non parametric approach. In the non parametric approach, as I mentioned. Normality assumption was common to both the classical and the Bayesian approach. We said, let's do a non-parametric approach. Let's devise a two-factor random effects model to add to the one-way random effects model developed by Rabafka. And so we investigated how well do these um, does this non-parametric approach perform uh, in these two-factor nested models. So the way we put this together, um, we asked a student, master's student, Christopher Erasmus, who graduated recently, and he assessed the performance of the bootstrap methodology proposed by Dazel, therefore uh, plugging that gap in our methodology. So Monte Carlo simulation approach was used. We um, now went and assessed the performance of models under the normality assumption. So that's when the Bayesian and the classical approaches where they are um, formulated. And then we also said, okay, let's introduce um, quite severe positive skewness and also some negative skewness with different distributions. And let's uh, assess the model performances. So that would be the classical, um, the Bayesian and the non-parametric under each of these and see how they hold up. So uh, this was the algorithm that uh, Christopher devised along with um, Yanni's influence and or Dacel's influence. And we could see that, that was, that's how the whole simulation study took place. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but you can see it's a fairly intricate um, algorithm. So the bootstrap-based tolerance intervals uh, that resulted here, for some reason, it's very, very blurry, it wasn't on earlier, um, showed that the proposed bootstrap-based approach was preferred to the alternatives where there was skewness present in the data generating process. It's very blurry now, I apologize, it wasn't blurry earlier, before I started the presentation, I uh, would never have left this slide. 
Needless to say, you can see that um, when you're looking for uh, content, um, the achieved content, you wanted to match these values over here. And for those of you who can see past the blur, you can see that the classical and Bayesian one, the Bayesian one seems to perform quite poorly. And um, there were reasons that were explained about why that happened. But the classical one performs admirably. So does the non-parametric one in your um, when your normal distribution is um, assumed. The minute you introduce some skewness, the non-parametric one does outperform the uh, classical one, but only slightly. And then um, that can be seen in the Wavell and the and the or the Wobble and the Pareto distributions. So this was uh, found for the beta expectation tolerance intervals, but for the alpha beta two-sided tolerance intervals, um, there was it was give and take between the classical approach and the non-parametric approach. Uh, they were fairly close. Um, in certain instances, the non-parametric approach achieved too much content, so it over uh, it overcovered, so to speak. Um, and so, at least for the beta expectation tolerance interval, the non-parametric approach works uh, best when faced with non-normal data. So this is what we found um, recently, and this is obviously a paper that we're busy uh, putting together for publication. The next thing that we looked at, so that puts aside the whole energy yield assessments, tolerance intervals, et cetera. That wasn't the only thing we did. We looked at uh, degradation and, and output predictions. So the first thing we did was um, try to devise a temperature-based PV degradation model. So um, for those of you who have solar panels, you know that they degrade at a certain rate every year um, so that the output is not uh, the output after 10 years is not the same as after um, one year or two year or when they're new. And so uh, von Skoltz, one of our students as well, modeled uh, the cumulative degradation of two kinds of PV modules. Again, the amorphous silicon and polycrystalline or polysilicon modules um, over a period, over a time period K using an erroneous uh, function. That's how it was derived, where this is the performance measure, this PR, and M is the baseline amount that needs to be, uh, that is the maximum output. And we modeled it using that, that equation over there. The um, future temp temp temperatures were predicted for Port Elizabeth, because this is where the modules were situated. We had a certain number of years of data where we could find those values, um, those unknown parameters. And we then fitted a CEREMA model, that's the model there, to predict the temperatures going forward for uh, Port Elizabeth, so that we could then plug these temperatures in for the next couple of years and assess what we think the degradation will look like going forward. So for a 20 year period, we then went and predicted what that degradation would do. And those are the predict, predict degradation patterns. And as you can see, it, it wa the wave varies, and that's obviously uh, in line with the temperature and seasons. So uh, solar panels tend to perform better in different seasons. Um, and you can see that for the polycrystalline uh, silicon module, it was an average of 4.6% uh, degradation in performance every year, and a 0.83% for the amorphous silicon, so slightly faster. And you can, and when we looked at the literature, that was what was predicted. Um, that was the within the range of what's predicted for these. But this provides a more um, concrete assessment of that performance or prediction of that performance. Again, this was this appeared in the SASE conference proceedings of 2021, and I presented that paper there. Something that's currently going, a Piwe, one of our master's students, I believe that he's also uh, watching at the moment. Um, use solar resource and weather information to predict future power output for our one megawatt system. So for those of you who don't know, we've got a big solar um, installation on our South campus, and we want to try and predict what kind of energy this is going to be to use using environmental, so re, uh, solar resource and weather variables. So using wind speed, humidity, temperature, um, irradiance uh, measures, we want to try and predict what kind of power output we can get. 
so the methods that we investigated or that are currently being investigated are support vector regression, artificial neural networks, and linear regression. So the study is ongoing. And um, for those of you who have any questions, Apu is in the, in the room, so you will happily answer those. All right, so now to our most prolific, I may as well end up, end with that one, um, investigation areas. This is fault detection and classification. So for our, um, Team, this is where we all kind of came together in one big way. Uh, we were approached by Prof and Dark and said they've got this problem, they've got these images, they want to try and be, try and classify faults. How do we do it? And we said, don't worry, that's a stats problem. We can look at those images, or we can teach a computer to look at those images, and we can classify them for you. Um, and that led us to approach our student uh, Christopher Dunderdale, and he. Um, went on to classify infrared images um, using several methods. So fault classification from infrared images, this was um, what he did. If you look down on the right-hand side there, those are the different kinds of faults that can affect a, um, a PV module. It's a very broad look at the kind of faults that can be, um, can be found. We, are, we, do, we do delve deeper into that um, topic with our future students. But what Dunderdale did was he said, let's look at a traditional feature-based method. So you extract features and then you classify the, the image according to those features um, using some sort of machine learning or statistical learning approach. Or the other alternative, which is obviously more common in the, um, in the literature is to use convolutional neural networks. But we thought, let's have a look at both approaches and see how they performed. The, Biggest issue with this data was that we only had 385 images and that was split into four fault classes. So for any of you who are familiar with um, image classification um, projects or studies, that is a very, very small number of images. You normally need images in the thousands at least to get a decent um, classification accuracy. So the nice thing about this is this represented some of the first investigations into the topic. Um, and so we were at the forefront with this study. So the results of Dunderdale's study came out that um, using the feature-based approach, you can see the results there are that the um, that it performed fine, but not great accuracies in the 70s. Um, and this, these are the fivefold cross-validated accuracies. So it, that's how the standard deviation and maximum were found. So for the, for the five assessments, the average accuracy was uh, 77%. So he, uh, Dunderdale then went and did uh, use convolutional neural networks. They performed better. Um, and with mobile net being best, he looked at three. I believe it was VGG16, ResNet, and MobileNet. And um, the data was augmented, but it was augmented for all of the approaches. And the average accuracy went up to 89.5%, which is a, a good accuracy uh, considering the number of images that were used and the, um, and the number of classes in the problem. So this way, we went on to then... Um, published this article at the in um, 2020. It's Ma and Dr. Clohesi's uh, most successful article with 74 citations as it stands on Google Scholar for a three-year-old paper. And we're very proud of this one. So um, that was, and that's because it's one of the first in this field. And so uh, uh, most of the, um, and there's been a lot of a lot of um, work in this field in recent years, and we were one of the first to get out there, so we are often cited. Yeah. All right, so I mentioned there was an the issue with sample sizes. So um, before we were able to get more images, we said, well, let's look at um, generative models to try and create synthetic images to assess or to help train our model so that we can now turn our 385 images into 4,000, 5,000 images. 
And we did that using variational autoencoders. So um, what a variational autoencoder does is that it encodes your data. I'll keep knocking my mic here. Um, it encodes your data and then down to a small uh, value and then it and then it decodes that value back into an image. And so what the variational autocoder does is that you don't you encode it down to a parameter of a distribution rather than a specific value and then you sample from that distribution to uh, decode it so that each sample now when you get those values will now be um, slight, uh, an image that's slightly different because slightly different values are going into that decoder to recreate the image. So um, that's how we can generate these uh, images and you can see a big block of generated solar panels there. I know you I know they don't look like solar panels but they are they are thermal images of solar panels. Um, and then we used those images to train the models uh, to see how that affected the, the accuracy. Uh, also, um, so it was found that the vi variational autoencoders took that Dunderdale accuracy of 89.5. And when we um, upped it and we augmented the data with these variational autoencoded um, training data, it pushed our accuracy up to 92%. So that, so provided evidence that these um, synthetic or generative models can provide a um, a useful tool to synthetically enhance your data set size and improve your accuracy. Um, I went and then investigated further to say, okay, well, an alternative to variational autoencoders are generated generative adversarial networks. I presented this study at um, JSM last year and it, it was found that the variational autoencoders still outperform the general generalized uh, sorry the generative adversarial networks, um, albeit only slightly, and that was throughout the throughout the study. Okay, so variational autoencoders still worked best, and then earlier this year, <clears throat> after a while in review and looking for reviewers, this paper was um, published. At the beginning of this year, and that is the results from um, from the pay, the variational autoencoder encoder study by by Vestrat. Um, all right. So what's Vestrat doing now? He's now a PhD student under the supervision of myself of the team. I shall refer to us as the team. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to grab some coffee. So what um, Vestrot is doing is investigating a novel architecture which will optimize for, in particular, will optimize for PV images. So PV images are unique in that they are they have a unique shape. They've got unique characteristics of hot, uh, hot and dark uh, and light spots. When when we've trained models, they've those models have all been built on. Um, a general image classification. So what is this a dog? Is that a horse? Is that a building? Is that a boat? So it's very general. So we figured that we could maybe simplify the model um, and um, focus it on these kind of images to try to um, perform better than the, the ones built for general image detection. Um, so that's the first part. The second part is that um, we're not only going to be looking at thermal images. He's going to be looking at um, optical images and optithermal images, which is just a layered optical image on top of a thermal image. So you get the best of both. Um, the reason we use optical images is particularly for the, the soiling category. So if there's, um, if there's dirt on the uh, top of a solar panel, that's not often picked up very well on a thermal image, but it is picked up very well on an optical image. So trying to layer them should give us a bit more information in those categories. That is showing good progress and promise at this stage, and we anticipate it to be done fairly soon. I'm going to finish off with um, what our future projects and research areas are planning on at the moment. I'm a little bit ahead of time, and the ones that I'm going to um, the 
areas that I'm going to focus on were just ones that I could think up in the moment. Um, we are, uh, Dr. Closey and I are presenting a workshop on the use of statistical methods. So it's a hands-on workshop. We'll be getting, we'll be delving into Python and R um, to do some statistical machine learning uh, techniques in renewable energy applications. And we'll be doing this at the SASEC conference uh, in November this year. Personally, I like the idea of variational autoencoders, and I'd like to explore their usefulness in other applications outside of renewable energy um, and outside of uh, image generation. So that's something I'm busy pursuing at the moment. In fact, when I agreed to do this presentation, that was what I wanted to present on, but I haven't gotten around to getting getting all the code done. Um, and we're also planning to investigate and determine some sort of optimal uh, Giza usage cycles um, with a firm, a local firm, uh, and in order to optimize and save electricity. And there are other uh, projects here and there that we are involved with. So that is my um, presentation as it stands. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. I do see that there were some chats. I don't know if that was, I didn't read them because I was presenting. So that's me for now. Uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Brittany, um, for giving a very good talk. Um, maybe I'm a bit biased. Um, so I'm going to start off asking, has anyone got any questions? You can perhaps just raise your hand. And also, if you don't feel like asking, you can use the meeting chat box as well. I have a question, Mohammed. You can unmute yourself and ask. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Warren, for this nice talk. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, did, you, did you ever use machine learning for solar forecasting? Or were um, you focusing on image processing? Yeah, no, I, we did actually use uh, machine learning methods for the prediction of degradation, and we've got a master's student uh, doing uh, output predictions for a, a installed PV um, plant uh, using weather conditions to do that. And we are using machine learning methods for that. So yeah, that, that is something that we have done. Okay. Uh, do you have, I mean, do you mind if sharing some of the papers in this area? Um, at the moment, we're, it's, a, it's a study that's under investigation. It hasn't been concluded yet. So I'm not in a position to share the results yet because they still need no, to be no, found. Sorry, not the result of your students. I mean, written papers, published papers in this field, if you do have it. Um, you mean data sets? No, no, not data set. Papers, articles. <laughs> Oh. Um, Warren, perhaps a degradation paper by Camilla. Camilla. Yeah, um, I, I will. I can share that with you if you send me an email, and I will be happy to share um, articles with you. Thank you. So and much. what we've done. Perfect. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? I'm scrolling through the participants just to see if anyone has their hand up. As I said previously, you can use the chat box, but um, Dr. Brittany's email address is on the um, summary for today's presentation. If you would like to contact him privately and if you have a question or would like to get involved in renewable energy research as well. Great. Thanks, everyone. I don't know if there's anything in the chat. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. It was great. I'm glad that I was able to put it all together. It's good to see it in all in one place. And thanks for listening. Oh, Warren, there's a question <laughs> from Vitz Ali. Okay. 
Montez Ali. You can unmute yourself. Um, yeah, there Mont might be a technical Montez issue. Montez is still muted. If you can just unmute. I see. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, there yeah. So, um, I was just uh, uh, telling that I uh, I joined a little la uh, later, so I couldn't follow exactly. But Nuruddin question uh, regarding Nuruddin question, he was asking. But he produced a PhD thesis under my supervision, where we looked at some of these three things from a mathematical and a statistical point of view. By statistical means the two statistic programming. So maybe your group can look at the thesis. And that's the reason I'm just, it's not a question, just uh, uh, telling you that we have a PhD thesis in this area. Uh, we'd be happy to have a look at that. If you can yeah. share that with when, me via when, email. When Nur, no, you can ask Nuruddin, uh, he just finished the PhD, so he can send you the thesis as well. Okay. I'll... Thank you. All right, thank you. Does anyone else have a last minute burning thought, question? Perfect. Um, so I just like to say I'm going to call this session to a close then. We'd just like to thank Dr. Brittany again for a very insightful presentation, just giving us into a bit of the statistical applications that have done in this field. Of course, there's numerous different areas that have been done, but it's nice to see that work is being conducted in our country in renewable energy. Um, I think that's all from my side. So thank you, Dr. Warren Brittany, and looking forward to next week's presentation. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.